Acts 9, 19 to 31. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by, providing that, by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill them, to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they sent him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church all throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Amen. Lord, it is such a pleasure to be together to give you the thanks. And we all give you thanks because of your Son, Jesus Christ, who you sent to the cross of Calvary to bear the weight of our sins. And there, as you unleashed your wrath on him, you were appeased for the judgment of our sin. And we say thank you. And now, Lord, we commit Hamish to you as he opens your word. Calm any nerves that he may have. Just give him a, a free-flowing thoughts and give him the assurance that he stands before a congregation that wants to listen to him as he speaks your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Hamish. Thanks. Thank you, Lincoln. So as always, it's a privilege to be able to learn from the Word of God with you today. And this morning we are looking at Acts 9, 19-31, which tells us what happened in Paul's life after he had met the risen Lord. Um, and we, we skipped the first uh, part of chapter 9 uh, last week, but I'm sure you're familiar with what happened there. In the beginning of chapter 9, the young man Saul was zealously committed to the ways of his forefathers, as he saw them to be. For him this meant climbing to prominence among the Pharisees and showing his zeal by aggressively persecuting the church. But then one day, along the road to Damascus, he was suddenly confronted by this Jesus of Nazareth, whose name and whose followers he was trying to eradicate from among the Jews. At first Saul couldn't comprehend who was speaking to him from the bright light that was shining down on him. Who are you, Lord, he said. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. The Lord Jesus, the Son of God, broke into the natural world and confronted Saul with his existence. It turned out that these people who were following the way of Jesus were right after all. Jesus is alive and he is the all-powerful Son of God. Saul was left blind um, after this experience. He was led by the hand into Damascus in verse 8. And Ananias was sent by the Lord to restore, restore Saul's sight. Saul was filled with the Spirit of God. His sight was restored and then he was baptised as a believer in Jesus. And it looked like he was so shocked by what had happened to him that he didn't eat for three days. His world had been turned upside down. He thought he had been fighting for the God of his fathers, but it turned out the whole time he had been fighting against him. This new group, these Nazarenes, these followers of the way, they wouldn't come to be called Christians until later. 
These people turned out to be telling the truth. It was real, and Saul now believed it. In verse 19, he had something to eat, and he was strengthened. He began to recover from the initial trauma and started to mentally assimilate what had happened to him and what this was going to mean for his life. So we're just now going to run through the chronology of this part of Saul's life and I'll make some comments as we go. At the beginning of today's verses, Saul spent a few days with the disciples in Damascus, verse 19. These are the people that he had come to Jerusalem to find so that he could drag them back to Jerusalem, um, come to Damascus to find, so he could drag them back to Jerusalem in chains for punishment. But now he has been humbled and seriously corrected. And now he is spending time with them as one of them. Saul seems to have been quite a driven, motivated sort of a character. And now he has seen who Jesus is and he's been filled with the, this Holy Spirit of God. And now he has a driving need to tell everyone the truth of what he has just experienced. So immediately Saul proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues in Damascus, saying, He is the Son of God, verse 20. He has come face to face with this reality and he wants all his fellow Jews to understand this Jesus is God incarnate. He is the Messiah that we've been waiting for. And as many people have noted before, the changed lives of those who saw the resurrected Jesus are a great evidence to the historical fact of the resurrection. Saul must have seen Jesus on the road to Damascus. There is no other plausible explanation of why his life suddenly changed so much and in the way it did. Up until that day, he was committed to fighting against the name of Jesus. It was public knowledge how committed he was, and years later there were still people among the believers who were unwilling to trust him because they knew how committed he had been against the name of Jesus. Up until that point, he had poured everything into his career in Judaism, and in one day he threw all of that away, everything that he had worked for up to that point. Later he reflected, as he wrote to the Philippians, that he was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all these things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. His old way of life ended abruptly and he abandoned his old ways immediately because he had met the living, resurrected Jesus. So then he started preaching that Jesus is the Son of God and everyone who heard him was confused and amazed because they all knew who Saul was and they had all heard why he was in Damascus. But here he was doing the exact opposite of what he had come to Damascus to do. Up until this point in his life, and unknown to Saul, the Lord had prepared him for this task of preaching Jesus. While he was a disciple of the Pharisees, while he was being educated, while he was engaging in the public life of Israel, and while he was persecuting the followers of Jesus, the Lord was setting him up for this dramatic change. Paul tells the Galatians that the Lord had set him apart before he was born. And if you're a believer in the Lord, risen Lord here today, you were also set apart before you were born. You are one of those whose name was written in the book of life before the foundation of the world. Revelation 17.8 The Lord also had a special task for Saul. The Lord told Ananias back in verse 15 of chapter 9 that Saul is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Unknown to Saul up until that point, this is what God was preparing him for, even while he was living a life of misguided aggression. 
We see the outworking of God's preparation in the fact that Saul is able to change gears so quickly after his conversion. In only a few short days, Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving Jesus was the Christ. Verse 22. Now he had seen the living Jesus, everything suddenly clicked and made sense. And every day he was gaining more capability to preach and debate in favour of the cause of Jesus. And his fellow Jews weren't able to stand up to the proofs he was laying out. They couldn't pick up what he was putting down. In Galatians chapter 1, Paul, as he was to become known, comments on this part of his life and adds some more information. He says straight after his conversion he spent some time living in Arabia and it was probably at this point between verses 22 and 23 that that happens. And I'm just going to read now from Galatians chapter 1 um, those particular verses. So Galatians chapter 1 verses 11 to 17. Paul says, for I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, in order that I may preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So Saul, after his conversion, went to Arabia, and that's not the modern Saudi Arabia that we think of. Uh, the place that they referred to Arabia, as Arabia in that time was the Arab Desert um, region that was to the east of um, Israel. So it um, goes from modern Syria down through uh, modern Jordan, um, that arid area um, of desert there. So Paul was living somewhere in that um, arid area for, for a certain time. In verse 12 he told us that he did not receive the gospel from any man, nor was he taught it, but that he received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. <coughs> it could be that while he was away living in this arid country that he received a fuller teaching of the gospel directly from the Lord beyond the initial revelation of Jesus that he ex had experienced on the road to Damascus. Some people would like us to believe that Saul lived like a medieval monk in the desert um, when he was in Arabia. But in Colossians chapter 2, he is critical of that kind of asceticism. asceticism. So I don't imagine he was living as an unwashed uh, hermit in a cave, um, you know, eating nothing but lentils and wearing clothes made out of sandpaper. I don't think so. At, after this time in Arabia, he went back to live in Damascus. After many days had passed, the Jews there ended up totally hating him. Um, 9, Acts 9.23 Obviously, he kept on proclaiming Jesus, and they couldn't defeat him in open, open debate. So they decided they were just going to simply kill him, to get rid of him. And Matthew Henry makes an interesting comment on this verse. He says... It is a bad cause that has recourse to persecution for its last argument. It is a bad cause that has recourse to persecution for its last argument. In other words, you can tell a bad ideology because the final argument they are left with is persecution. Its adherents struggle to make a rational, reasoned defence, and so in the end they just turn to abuse without bothering to give logical justification for what they're doing. And as we see Western civilization decaying around us, I think the church is probably going to experience more and more of this. Um, I think we're coming into an age where reasoning is giving way to unqualified dogmatism and people who are opposed to Jesus are becoming less willing to rationally engage with believers on a public level and give a reasoned defense. 
in they're coming to a point where they just want us to shut up and eventually it may come to um, a point where it's shut up or else but all of that is in the hands of the Lord. So Saul somehow found out that the Jews had a plan to kill him, verse 24. Damascus was a walled city and they had people on the gates of the city waiting to give the alert if Saul tried to get out of town. In the night his disciples, the people he had been teaching, let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket, which sounds quite dodgy, um, but is probably a better option than trying to exit through a gate because the gates were being watched. Then he found himself in the open countryside on the road south to Jerusalem in the middle of the night and that wasn't safe either. Cities had walls and gates not only for military purposes but also for general security. There were bad guys living in the open country who would violently rob travellers like we see in the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, you may remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul lists the physical dangers that he had faced as an apostle of Jesus. Here's a few of them. Dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness. And in this instance that we read about in Acts chapter 9, he had all of those particular dangers in the space of a few days. His new life that he had embarked on was often going to be physically dangerous for him, but he was prepared to face that because he had met the risen Jesus. In verse 26, Paul makes it to Jerusalem, and he naturally wanted to join up with the other believers when he got there. But the believers there were scared of him. Everyone knew what he had done to the church in the past, and they didn't trust him. But the Lord brought Barnabas into Saul's life at this point. God put the right person in the right place at the right time. We know Barnabas was an encourager. He was a good man. We know from his later involvement in the life of Mark, he was prepared to give someone a chance to prove themselves and also a second chance to prove themselves. The church was scared of Saul. But Barnabas brings his new friend Saul to the apostles and tells them about how he had seen Jesus and the Lord had spoken to him and how at Damascus he had boldly preached in the name of Jesus. This guy Saul is okay, he's one of us now. So Saul lived among the apostles for a while at this point and he preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Jerusalem also, verse 28. He had seen the risen Jesus and he wanted everyone to know the truth of that. And the same pattern developed here in Jerusalem. He publicly debated the Hellenists, that is the Greek-speaking Jews, and the final argument the Hellenists would bring against him was going to be murdering him. They couldn't prove him wrong and they couldn't shut him up. The religious tradition they had had been methodically emptied of its godliness and its ability to rightly educate the conscience. And so looking for a way to kill Saul was an acceptable solution for them. When the brothers learned of this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus, verse 30. So these people who he had once tried to exterminate are now his brothers in the family of God and they are caring for his welfare and saving his life. It's interesting how God brings unexpected changes into our lives. At this point, I'm going to cut back to um, Galatians chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Paul writes, After three years I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him fifteen days, but I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. So these verses, in these verses here, he may be referring to this trip we're reading to, of, trip to Jerusalem, Jerusalem we read of in um, Acts chapter 9, or it may be another trip to Jerusalem. But whichever it was, we know that three years after his conversion, Saul went up to Jerusalem and spent 15 days with Peter. And the Greek implies that Saul is hanging out with Peter in order to get him to know him better. So after this in Galatians um, 1.21, 
uh, after this, Galatians 1.21 tells us that Saul went back to the provinces of Syria and Cilicia, which includes uh, Tarsus, the capital city of Cilicia, which was Saul's hometown. And Luke is just about to go back and pick up on Peter's story in Acts 9.32. And um, the next Luke is going to mention uh, Saul is in Acts chapter 11, when Barnabas goes to find Saul. And at that point, uh, Barnabas finds Saul still living in Tarsus. Uh, our last verse of today's text is Acts 9.31, which tells us that the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. The three provinces of Judea, Galilee and Samaria were the geographical extent to which the church had reached at that point. They had peace from being persecuted at this time and were able to consolidate and build each other up. The times of peaceful building for the church are a blessing from God and we often take them for granted. If we look back through the history of, church, of the church, it is often not allowed to build in peace. Uh, we can be thankful for the opportunities we get to build without persecution. And so walking in the, faith, the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the church multiplied. So to sum up all these events, we can say, after Saul met the living, risen Jesus on the road to Damascus, his life completely changed. This is one of, or arguably, the most radical conversions that we know of. Here was a man who was committed to persecuting the church. He was philosophically and religiously ardent about destroying the church, and he didn't just talk about doing it, he was spending his time actually getting people physically dragged away. What he then experienced on the road to Damascus forced him within a small number of days to change the entire course of his life 180 degrees. He was now suddenly publicly arguing in convincing fashion that Jesus was the Christ. If you meet the risen Jesus, he will change you. The change for most of us is not nearly as outwardly spectacular as what we see in Saul's life. But if you have met him and he is in your life, he will change you. He can not be with you and not change you. If you know him and he has begun a good work in you, he has set you on a path of change. If you have been justified by him, he will place you in a process of sanctification. Being justified before God by the work of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins is not something that can happen to us without affecting who we are and what we do. You can't become a new creation without becoming a new creation. There's a couple of people I've spoken to before about Christian things and they've given me a flippant response, I love the Lord. And I know that what they're saying to me is nonsense. I know they don't love the Lord. How do I know they don't love the Lord? I know because they've spent their entire lives ignoring what he has spoken and nothing has ever changed in them. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth says John in 1 John 1, 6. John goes on to say in 1 John chapter 2, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So it's not like we meet Jesus and then suddenly become perfect and completely sinless. Paul still did some of the sinful things he didn't want to do. We read about that in Romans. We don't become suddenly perfect and sinless, but if we have met him and we do know him and we do love him, it will affect the pattern of our life. He will change us. John says, by this we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments, whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. 
By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. 1 John 2, 3 to 6. People who know Jesus are supposed to live out that relationship. It is going to show and you will change. So we see in today's text that Saul changed. What we are briefly going to look at um, we are now briefly going to look at four specific ways we see in these verses in which Saul changed. The first thing that we're going to note is that what he believed about Jesus changed. We don't know exactly what Saul believed um, about Jesus before his conversion, but it obviously wasn't positive. Um, back in chapter 5, we see the rabbi Gamaliel putting the followers of Jesus in the same category as a guy named Thudas, who had claimed to be somebody and led a revolt, and also a guy named Judas the Galilean, who was a revolutionary and the founder of the Zealots. Gamaliel was, Gamaliel was putting Jesus and his followers in the same box as these revolutionaries and insurrectionists. And that's the angle the Jews took with Pontius Pilate when they were trying to get Jesus crucified. You need to execute this man because he is claiming to be the king of the Jews. And I think Saul probably thought along similar lines. Jesus was just another one of these radicals and we don't want his adherents disturbing the peace. But then Saul actually met Jesus. What Saul believed about Jesus changed completely after he met him. We find him standing up in the synagogues of Damascus proclaiming he is the son of God. Jesus doesn't, wasn't just a progressive rabbi with a political agenda who is now dead. He is God. A terrifying holy glorious light flashed from heaven and I fell to the ground and Jesus who is Lord spoke to me from heaven, he is God. And Saul now believed that Jesus is the promised Messiah. He confounded the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ and probably he was using the Old Testament to do that. For many of us, when we meet Jesus, the things we believe about him change a great deal. We formerly believed the lies of the devil or we believed the lies of false teachers or false religions or we just went along with what the world said. But now God has given us an understanding of who Jesus is. He is who he claimed to be. What the Bible records about him is historical reality. Um, for some of us this is different. Um, for some of us we've believed the basic truth about Jesus for some time before we came to know him. Uh, we may have been raised to know the truth like Timothy was. Um, I can't personally remember a time not believing what Jesus said about himself. That's what I was taught and I knew it was right. But I loved my sin and I didn't want to submit to that. I had the same type of belief that demons have. They know exactly who Jesus is, but they refuse to live in obedience to him. For those of us who are raised with that knowledge of who Jesus is, the Lord still has to grant us repentance so that we can live in obedience to what we know from the heart. And we change in that way. But for many of us, as for Saul, our thinking about who Jesus is has changed a great deal. And I want to note here that our belief about who Jesus is is crucial. The apostles and the associates didn't teach all faith is positive and Jesus can be whatever makes you happy. The core of their teaching was a set of accurate beliefs about the real Jesus, the Jesus that they knew. Only belief in the real Jesus can lead to the real salvation that the real Jesus alone gives. What did Saul start preaching when he became converted? Jesus is the Son of God. That's what he started preaching. He is the Christ. Correct belief about Jesus is critical. I'll go back to 1 John again. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. 
1 John 2, 22-23. If you have a wrong belief about the person of Jesus, you have a false religion that is built on lies. The second way in which Saul changed is that he is now using his abilities for Jesus rather than against him. Saul was an educated and intelligent man. He was trained as a Pharisee. He was a student of the famous Rabbi Gamaliel. He knew what the scriptures said and he was advancing beyond others of his age. He was a smart guy before he met Jesus. And he was a smart guy after he met Jesus. But the difference is he is now using what God has given him to serve Jesus. If anything, his abilities were now sharper and more dynamic because he was indwelt and empowered by the Holy Spirit and his world view had been corrected. Saul used his education and intelligence to become one of the greatest thinkers and apologists that the church has known. In these verses today we see him silence the Jews in Damascus and we see him debating the Hellenistic Jews in Jerusalem. And as we go through the book of Acts we often see him preach and teach and debate and reason with a wide variety of people in a wide variety of situations. When we meet Jesus, we come with the natural abilities and the set of knowledge and past experiences that God has given us. And added to that, the Lord gives us spiritual gifts. Then we begin to begin the process of laying all of this before him and saying, how can I serve you with what you have given me? Very few of us will be called to do something as public and spectacular as Saul was. But when Jesus comes into our lives, he changes us and calls us to serve him rather than ourselves. And that service may be something great or something small, but he sees it and it matters to him. The third thing that Saul, that changed in Saul's life is his friends became his enemies and the people that he regarded as enemies became his friends. He wanted to eradicate those people who followed the way of Jesus and they feared him, and they still feared him for a long time after his conversion, which was probably a sensible precaution. Eventually they came to trust that the change in him was genuine. They knew, once they knew that he was genuine, they treated him as a fellow brother in God's family. And we can see these, in these verses, they saved his life on two different occasions. We will see in other occasions in Acts that Paul was quite fearless about his personal safety, but the church wanted to preserve him intact to continue in his work. We see the grace and forgiveness of God at work through the church here. They don't seem to have held Saul's past against him. Once they got past the initial fear, they seemed to have accepted him without holding grudges and without holding his past against him which is how the church is supposed to operate. We, of all people, ought to know what re real forgiveness and acceptance means because that's what God has shown to all of us and that's what we pass on to other people. Something that I want to note here is that Saul lost a great deal when he began to follow Jesus, which he was willing to do for the sake of knowing Christ but even so, it's important to have the support of a church family when you've left so much behind. Reading Paul's letters, we can tell how much that support of the church meant to him. Some people lose a lot when they decide to follow Jesus. They can lose family or friends or property or their status in the community. Sometimes their liberty and in some cases they lose their lives. Even in New Zealand, sometimes people can lose a lot by obeying Jesus and it's important to be family to people who have lost a lot because of that. So the people Saul regarded as his enemies became his friends. And at the same time, the people Saul once saw as his friends became his enemies. He was just, uh, he wasn't going out of his way to make enemies, he was just publicly making a good case for Jesus the Messiah and the Jews ended up hating him for doing that. And I recently read a story about a Jewish man who had come to believe in Jesus and his fellow Jews told him that he was no longer a Jew. Like Saul, he was rejected by his people for the sake of Jesus. 
All of us in some way have had an experience of being alienated from someone because we love Jesus. Why does that happen? Why do people turn away from us like that? John says in John chapter 3, Whoever believes in me, Jesus, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the Son, only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come into the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes into the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. When we come to the light and walk in the light, and what we do is clearly seen to be carried out in God, those who are still in darkness don't like that. If someone loves the darkness, then they are going to be repelled by me if I show forth light. This is what is happening to Saul here. He has come into the light and is setting forth the illuminating truth of Jesus. And those who are still in darkness are hating this because their works are evil. The fourth way that we see Saul's life change is that he now has a different purpose in life. Before Saul met Jesus, he was a driven individual. He was zealous and given over to the tasks he had in front of him which were advancing through the ranks of Judaism and Phariseeism and perse persecuting the believers. After he met Jesus, he was still a driven individual. He was still wholly given to the tasks he had in front of him. But now the Lord had picked him up, given him a bit of a slapping, figuratively speaking, and pointed him in the right direction, which is what we all need. Back in verse 15, the Lord told Ananias that Saul is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and, kings and the children of Israel. Of course, his life changed in a way that God had foreordained. Oh, the, sorry, the course of his life changed in a way that God had foreordained. But Saul could never have guessed beforehand the way in which his life was going to change. The idea of travelling around preaching to Gentiles would have seemed ridiculous and offensive to the point of blasphemy to his, to his former self. In chapter 22 of Acts, Paul tells a crowd in Jerusalem that the Lord had sent him to the Gentiles. And if a Roman guard hadn't been uh, there on the spot at that time, the crowd would have killed him right then. That's exactly the same way Saul himself used to think. But now his life is unexpectedly different. When we meet Jesus, he gives us a different purpose in life. And finally, I'm going to ask, how was it that Saul changed? How did he change? What made that change happen? Did education change him? Some people think that education will cure all the ills of modern society. Was Saul saved by his education? No. Education is good when we use it correctly, but that wasn't, his education wasn't what led him to renewing truth. Did hard work and zeal and dedication bring about the vital change in Saul's life? No. All that dedicated energy he had in his previous life was being poured into the wrong things. All that dedication and hard work wasn't the thing that had changed him. Did religion change Saul? No, religion did not change Saul. Saul had plenty of religion. He had religion up to his eyeballs, but it was a hollow, godless religion. It was the religion of man without the living truth in it. That kind of religion has no power to change our hearts. So what, <coughs> excuse me, so what made him change so suddenly and so profoundly? The thing that made him change was he met the risen, living Jesus. He became a different person through the power of the living Son of God. He was on a path of destruction. He was destructive, destructive to other people. And although he didn't realise it at the time, he was on a path that would ultimately be self-destructive 
and would lead to the judgment of God. But the power of God changed him. We are all by nature sinful and broken and living in rebellion against God and we can't make ourselves something new. Education won't do that. Hard work won't do that. Man-made religion won't do that. We have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Only God through Jesus Christ has the power to make us new. He is the all-powerful creator and he is the only, only he has the power to recreate us. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Only God can renew our souls like that. All of us are dependent on the power of God to save us and transform us. In Galatians chapter 1, Paul concludes this period of his life by saying that the churches of Judea heard that he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. Those churches rightly glorified God for the changed life of Saul, because the glory and honour belongs to God for changing us and giving us new lives. Amen. Lord, I thank you that you have the power to change us. Thank you that the power of change is in you. Thank you that you renew us and give us new lives in you. Thank you for the work you have done in us. Amen.